do, no matter who you are, no matter where you are on your journey, you are welcome here. There are a couple <clears throat> of an announcement updates I would like to make, um, but I, I encourage you to make sure you scroll down on Hot Topics and look at all those opportunities to um, be involved in the life of the church and the work of the church. And so there are opportunities to serve, to donate, to make yourself heard, needs of people in prayer and so forth. And there are also opportunities for us to grow in spirit. I would like to uh, do a couple of updates. Um, I've heard from uh, Juanita and uh, Clive Thompson and they send a big hello and thank you for all the, the love and prayers and the donations which made it possible for them to successfully pay the attorney who is helping them inch towards the, their green cards. Also, um, I want to point out um, a couple of growth opportunities. The um, um, Ten Commandments uh, series is going forth tomorrow evening at 7. All you have to do is click on the Bible study link and that will get you in. Uh, the Bible study, although it, it says on Hot Topics that it's 3 o'clock, we've gone back to the original 1 o'clock time. So if you click on that link at 1 o'clock, you'll get into Bible study. Um, so is there anybody else who has a, an announcement that should be made? Okay, the last thing, I just want to um, make sure that everybody has gotten their book for the One Book, One Church special uh, service and discussion on November 29th. Um, it's a marvelous book to read. It's quite dense, so you have to spend some time with it. But it's a marvelous journey of um, of Ibram Kendi, who con uh, confronted his own racism as a black man and has taken us on that journey with him. So now let us begin to center as we go into our acknowledgments. As a faith congregation, we acknowledge that this is a pivotal moment in American history and that our mission is clearly laid out in the gospel of Jesus. We acknowledge our mission to seek justice for black and brown people of all genders and orientations, to dismantle systems of bias and racism, to call out those who protect the power of state-sponsored violence against black and brown bodies, and to recenter the voices of the marginalized of our community and society. We acknowledge our part perpetuating white norms of language, style, worship, behavior, and culture. And with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we acknowledge the truth that black lives matter. We acknowledge also that this service of worship is being held on the traditional lands of the Lenai Lenape people. And we pay respect to elders past and present. We affirm the sacredness of native people, their languages, their cultures, and their gifts to the church and to the world.
Let us begin with our call to worship. Prayer is not exactly our native tongue, O oh Lord. We hesitate, or cogitate, then corrode into cliché. Who knows how to address holiness or converse with mystery? Perhaps with curious awe, simple silence, open hearts? Our difficulty in praying is awkward, yet strangely accurate, O oh God. Bless our loss for words as a reminder that you and we are absolutely different, separate but not equal, lone yet longing. We cannot simply flow and merge with you, O oh God, because while we are participating in creation, you are sustaining it. <clears throat> While we are enjoying life, you are giving it. While we are groping for grace, you are generating it. Prayer is not our native tongue, O oh Lord. And yet we are restless until we learn the language of soul and the geography of faith. Lord, we begin to notice how often our prayer has the language of catching up, striving, earning, getting worthy. God, we pray, forgive our failings, deepen my faith, make me more active in your service. Somehow that browbeating migraine meditation on shortcomings that are no secret to you or to our friends feels like praying to a mirror. Maybe you arrive by dawning, Lord. Maybe praying is always beginning again. So Holy One of creation, begin us again. Holy us born. Free us fresh. Open us, yes.
Let us begin with our morning prayer. God of pleasure and no less of pain, we begin again in praying the mysteries of evil and illness, danger and dread. Grant to us and all we love and should love the recovery of thy counsel in the midst of trouble. Restore the lonely to friendship, the suffering to meaning, the grieving to hope. Prayer is hardly our native tongue, O oh Lord. So thank we thee for coming to converse with us in bodied person through each other and through word made flesh in Jesus. Amen. God of unchangeable power, when you fashioned the world, the morning stars sang together, and the host of heaven shouted for joy. Let us join in this song of glory and be a source of kindness and peace for all creation. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. We're going to go to breakout rooms today, so you're welcome to unmute yourself. And remember, some people may not be comfortable unmuting, and let's be patient with them. There should be an invitation to join a breakout room on your screen. Morning, Birdie. Good morning. Morning. I, if I could, I would be jumping up and down. <laughs> Good morning. I would Good morning. be doing, I'd be doing cartwheels and flips. <laughs> you, you can you can just visualize that. Yes, yes, we can. <laughs> How's everyone doing? Great, great. Yeah, doing well. Doing very well. Good. Yeah, I, I don't have to be a a boo leader. Now I can be a cheerleader again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm keeping my fingers crossed until January 20th. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Sure. Dave, how's the family? How's Martha and Ellen Cooper? And everyone? Oh yeah, we're, we're, we're hunky dory over here. We're just happy as clams. <laughs> Ella has a big soccer game today. She's she had to leave uh, Philadelphia to get on a soccer team, so okay. she got on the Glenside team, and they are one of the best teams in the country. So, oh wow! Okay, so we got lucky. And how how's how's it going with everybody else? <laughs> Going, it's going very well. Staying safe and involved and projects galore. Yeah, yeah I'm grateful for this. Uh, these warm days, yesterday and today, it's looking like another. Yeah. Like a warm day as well. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's good to get cool. out and walk. Yeah. Yeah. I'm doing all right. Doing all right. <laughs> yeah, I, I still try to try to wrap my head around uh, how many people are dying around, you know, how many fellow citizens of of my country and my world are are, are getting sick and dying. It's like how how do you even how do you even fathom that? Mm. Yeah, it is. It is an unreal situation because we know so little about it. You know, it's not something we can tackle. You know, like we're used to, you know, let's take a take a pill or Yeah, we're we used can, to having answers and, yeah, and we don't. <laughs> and we and we don't. We you know. Well, 
I'm so used to watching, you know, I, I've been working with around healthcare for a long time and I'm so used to seeing people decline and, and then have a natural process around dying. But this is just oh. unbelievable. Yeah, it's frightening. It's frightening. Keep the faith. Yeah. We have to go back. Yeah. And stay safe, everyone. Bye-bye. Oh, oh, we have to go. Okay, bye-bye. See you, Gabe. Good seeing you, Dave. Every, everything's okay, it sounds like, then? You look great, man. Thanks, Dave. Um, How's that you know, beautiful I'm, wife of yours? <laughs> she's doing all right. She's doing all right. But, you know, she's... Uh, She's getting through the semester. It's a strange time for all of us, but uh, how's the family in Langhorn? Family in Langhorn is doing doing okay. I don't know if I told you, but they all got COVID. Uh, like, oh my God! Uh, no. About a month ago. Um, they controlled. She didn't have to think about how to control her own life. He right. controlled her every movement. And she went back to that until she finally realized oh, maybe this isn't so healthy after all. You're right. Exactly. It's amazing yeah. to me. All right, it's time for us to move on in the service. All right. I'm gonna mute everybody. Bye all, have a good day. Absolutely. Today's scripture reading is from Matthew 7th chapter, verses seven to 12. Ask and keep asking and you will receive. Seek and keep seeking and you will find. Knock and keep knocking and the door will be open to you. For the one who keeps asking receives, the one who keeps seeking finds, and the one who keeps knocking enters. Is there any among you who would hand your daughter a stone when she asked for bread? Would one of you hand your son a snake when he asked for a fish? If you, with all your faults, know how to give your children what is good, how much more will your Abba God in heaven give good things to those who ask? Therefore, treat others as you would have them treat you. This is the whole meaning of the law and the prophets.
This morning's contemporary reading comes from The Girl Who Sang to the Buffalo, which is the third volume of a, a three volume series by Kent Nurburn about his um, endeavors with the Lakota Native Americans. Tell me about the wolf and the dog, he said. The wolf is strong, I said. It's my favorite animal. It only takes what it needs. It is good to its family, just like you taught. It always watches everything. And the dog? The dog is helpful. It has a good heart. It always is by the side of the people. It will give its life for the people. Which one sounds like you? I think the dog, grandfather, I said. Good morning. So at first hearing, which are you? The wolf or the dog? Both are positive role models. The wolf only takes what it needs and is good to its family. The dog is helpful and has a good heart. Perhaps sometimes you are more like the wolf and at other times more like the dog. This morning I'm going to take you on a journey. And my hope is that at the end of it all, you will want to be the dog, specifically as it relates to veterans. So I invite you from time to time on this journey to think about the wolf and the dog. We call this service Veteran Sunday. I like to think of it as the Sunday we acknowledge veterans and claim our own. I am the only one, the only veteran among us who chose to speak this morning. At first I questioned whether or not this meant the service was going to the dogs, but then I decided I really wanted it to go to the dogs as will become evident. So after my short message, Alicia Kennedy from Alpha Bravo K9 will give a short message about their efforts. The universe is made up of stories, not of atoms. So said Muriel Rockhauser. I've always liked that quote and what I see as the truth in it. So this morning's journey is one that includes some of my life stories, stories of connectivity leading to successfully negotiating military service, including a tour in Vietnam, and recovery after that tour. It has been 52 years since I was drafted into the Army. At that time, I had a brand new college degree and not much common sense. I had knowledge, but not much ability to assess things. Both got me into the Army and helped me survive the Vietnam War. I was naive enough to think I would not get drafted, naive enough to think they wouldn't send me to Vietnam, and naive enough to think that the Army would use my talents and expertise to its best advantage. So in short order, I was in the Army on a train to Fort Bragg, North Carolina for basic training, on a plane to Fort Polk, Louisiana for jungle warfare training, and on another plane headed for Benoit Air Base in Vietnam, where they never asked me about my talents and expertise. When drafted, I did not realize that other draftees were not like me. When we were assigned to training companies at Fort Bragg, I seemed to be the only one who had brought books with me. Not only that, but my choice of reading seemed to be suspect as at the time I was reading The Diary of Che Guevara and Write Me In by Dick Gregory. The army took my books and never gave them back. 
To say I felt disconnected is an understatement. One week during basic training, they put up a notice saying that if we had a relative to pick us up, we could have a weekend pass. As luck would have it, Dave Spain, who had been my boss for several summers of a job in Washington, DC, wrote to say he was traveling south, would pass by Fort Bragg and was going to stop and see me. When Dave arrived, I grabbed him, told him to say he was my uncle and pulled him into the company headquarters office. Despite the incredulous look I got from the sergeant, I got my weekend pass and Dave and I headed to south of the border where I got to sleep in a comfortable bed and eat good food. What a blessing. On the not such a blessing side of the scales were the chaplain at Fort Polk during jungle warfare training who, when I told him I didn't think I could shoot anyone, gave me a wait and see answer, which I found odd. And the stories on the plane to Vietnam who explained to me and my seatmate that if the plane landed under fire, meaning people were shooting at us, that we were expected to push open the door, release the slide, and stand at the bottom holding the slide while the rest of the passengers slid down and ran to safety. I very calmly and politely told her that if there were people shooting at us, there was no way I was standing at the bottom of the plane while others ran to safety. In Vietnam, I was assigned to a battalion and then a company in the usual way. When I arrived at the S1, which is the battalion administrative office, I was signed in by a soldier who had been drafted just like me. I sat there for 20 minutes, telling him all of my talents and expertise that I thought might qualify me for a job that wasn't out where the shooting was going on. Nonetheless, out I went. After a month or so, I got called into the S-1 to take over that soldier's job as his tour of duty was over. When I asked him how he had come to pick me, he said that in all the time he had that job, no one had ever sat for 20 minutes and told him everything he could do. So when it came time to get his replacement, he remembered that and chose me. So then I had another blessed connection. After 14 months in Vietnam, I was coming home. The process was the same as the one that sent us to Vietnam. There, was, there were scheduled readings of passengers for the next flight. And if your name was called, you went through final processing. And if not, you were free until the next scheduled reading. During one of these waits, I remember talking to other soldiers and saying how ready I was to get back to the United States and fit right in where I'd left off. It could be said that physically I was about the same as when I'd arrived, but what I was unaware of was the mental toll the tour had taken. So in fact, when I arrived back in the United States, I did not fit right in. In fact, I didn't really fit in at all. After graduating from Dickinson College, I had been drafted while my friends had gone on to grad school or jobs. I was returning from spending 14 months in Vietnam while my friends had spent 14 months in Washington, D.C. or New Haven, Connecticut, get to name two places. These places now felt like home to them. What felt like home to me was the campus of Dickinson College. But what I did have was support connections. You might say I had prayers that were answered and angels looking over me. I processed out of the army at Fort Dix, New Jersey. Along with others doing the same, I got a limo to Philadelphia Airport. There I called my friend Sandy who lived in Plymouth Meeting and asked if she'd like to pick me up. Imagine, 
getting a call out of the blue from someone you haven't heard from in years and being asked if you'd like to pick them up and take them home with you. Sandy and I had, gone up, had grown up together and had attended the same high school and church. She said yes. A couple weeks later, I visited my college roommate, Bob, who was in law school in Washington, DC. After that, I visited my college friend, Trish, who was now a teacher in New Haven and who had kindly invited me to go with her on a cross country camping trip that summer. On that trip, we stopped to see Auntie Ruth in Toledo, Ohio. Auntie Ruth was Uncle Ted's wife and Uncle Ted had been the pastor of the Mount Airy Presbyterian Church where my family had attended. We stopped in Chicago where I got to see another college friend, Donna. Upon my return from the camping trip, I decided to make Philadelphia my home and happened on to an apartment that was over a doctor's office because that doctor was a friend of a doctor who was a best friend of my mother. Not only did I get the apartment, I got it furnished with furniture the doctor had left over from, another, from other rental properties. Then Sandy got me into a singing group called the Now Time Singers. George Ault was a member of that group and when I shared with him that I was being unsuccessful in finding a church, he suggested Fumcog, where he was one of the assistant pastors. Deciding on a career path was more problematic. I had thought of being a lawyer and had taken the LSATs in Saigon and was accepted to George Washington University Law School. That is until I visited former roommate and now law student, Bob. I tried selling insurance, which was an unmitigated disaster. Once I decided I wanted to be a teacher, I, I just wrote to schools asking if they needed a teacher until one assistant principal, who was also a Dickinson graduate, wrote back saying I clearly had no idea how to become a teacher and telling me what I needed to do. So many blessed connections. So it was seen that then that with the help of all these connections, I survived my military Terry service in good shape. And I would agree to a large extent, but here's the thing. I still have memories I can't share with anyone without completely breaking down. I tried watching a documentary on Vietnam and the first thing that happened was helicopters coming over the horizon and it was all I could do to get the TV turned off and then lie there for a time and to recover. I have a close friend who was a history teacher at the Hill School. She was teaching a conflicts class and asked if I'd talk to her classes. Her department head joined us for the combined class session and during the question answer part, he asked me what my favorite war movies were. I don't watch war movies, especially Vietnam war movies. It's too difficult and not at all productive, enlightening or entertaining. You look at me then and you see someone who has been able to fully function in the world with the support I've gotten from companions I've been able to count on throughout my journey. But there are other veterans who cannot function in the world because of the mental state their experience has, le has left them in. The one that gets the most press is PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, but there are others. These veterans pray for support and companionship, which some are able to receive through the service dogs provided through Alpha Bravo K9. And so now I'd like to invite Alicia Kennedy from Alpha Bravo K9 to discuss the plight of these veterans and how Alpha Bravo service dogs are helping them to function in daily life. But first, by way of segue from me to her, here's Carrie Newcomer singing a shovel is a prayer. Thank you. 
A shovel is a prayer to the farmer's foot when it steps down and the soft earth gives way. A baby is a prayer when it's finally asleep. A whispered amen at the end of the day. And a friend is a prayer when they bring over soup, when they laugh at your jokes and they don't ask for proof. It's a song that you sing when you are alone, when you're weak. There's nothing to do What you've been looking for is looking For you I'm the prodigal daughter You're the dissonant son We've been washed in rainwater We're the fortunate ones On the other side of midnight Just before the dawn You can feel it coming up when the long night is done It's as heavy as grief And it's weightless as smoke It's the dream you forgot It's a letter you wrote It's the first bird's morning That sound like a hymn Jones, we are Gracie and George, we're Watson and Holmes. The air is filled with angels, there's no devil to outrun. Just sigh and kiss the ground when the long night is done. It's a collar turned up, a kiss on the forehead, a string and two cans, it's the last thing you said. It's a hunch that you follow, a light in the dark, an idiot check. It's a bomb for your heart, for all your searching, there's nothing to do. What you've been looking for is looking for you. Thanks for the spotlight, Wayne. I apologize. I have quite the cold. <laughs> I had cold. Not feeling great about the spotlight <laughs> today, but I'll take it. Um, thank you all so much for inviting me to join. Um, hey, my name is Alicia Kennedy. Um, I'm here representing Alpha Bravo Canine. Um, this has been such a great way to start my day, so thank you so much. And Wayne, thank you for the kind um, introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I hope everybody can see. Thumbs up. Everyone see my slides? Okay, perfect. Okay, let me move the video over here. Um, <clears throat> so appreciate the invitation. Um, you know, Veterans Day is coming up um, on the 11th. I think it's a really important 
opportunity for us to stop and pause and reflect on um, what it means, um, you know, to be of service and the sacrifice um, that veterans and their families make. Um, and so um, I'm here a little bit today to talk about um, how service dogs um, can um, be of service to, to veterans. So Alpha Bravo Canine um, is the first and only um, nonprofit organization in the greater Philadelphia area to raise, train, and donate um, service dogs to the veteran population. Um, this organization, we were founded about five years ago by a mother-son um, team, Jennifer Green, who's pictured here on the left, and her son, Kevin. Um, myself, I actually met Jennifer about eight years ago. Um, I hired her to help me train my own dog. Um, and when she established this organization, um, I of course wanted to kind of get behind her and support her as a friend. Uh, but then shortly thereafter, one of my brothers enlisted in the United States Marine Corps, um, the same branch of the military that her son Kevin served in. Um, and suddenly the affinity I had for this organization and the good work that we do took on a much more personal and deep meaning. Um, so I'm really proud um, to be a board member um, of this organization. Um, our service dogs are primarily psychiatric service dogs, but they're cross-trained in a number of other functional um, and mobility tasks, which I'll get to um, on a later slide. And I should say, if at any point in time someone has a question, feel free to unmute yourself um, and jump right in. Um, so as Wayne touched on, <clears throat> What we do matters because one in four active duty service members um, show signs of a mental health condition, and that's just active duty. Um, there are three mental health conditions that are most prevalent. Um, the first being post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and shockingly, the rate of PTSD is about 15 times higher um, in those that serve in our military as opposed to the civilian population. Um, depression and anxiety are also um, found quite prevalently uh, among our military servicemen and women. And then again, traumatic brain injury, um, which is much more common um, in veterans of uh, more recent conflict in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, about 20% of veterans who served in those two conflicts um, return with post-traumatic stress um, and brain injury. I'm sure you've also probably heard um, the figure 22 and what that means for the veteran population, um, that's the suicidality rate. Um, and it's estimated that about 22 veterans um, take their life every day um, through their struggles with these mental health conditions. So what is a service dog and how are service dogs distinguished from other types of support animals? Um, service dogs are the only type or only classification of animal that are protected by the American Disabilities Act, okay? Um, they are working animals, they're not pets, um, and they're very highly trained to perform individual tasks to support their handler. Um, those tasks, again, I'll get to in a later slide, but can be, um, wide ranging to support any sort of disability, whether it be physical, sensory, or intellectual. Um, so if you see a service dog in public, know that that access to the public is protected by the American Disabilities Act. Um, other types of support animals you've likely heard of are therapy dogs and emotional support animals. Therapy dogs are often trained in basic obedience and they have a really good disposition um, you may see them in hospitals, nursing homes, reading programs, um, sometimes in judicial settings to provide comfort, um, but those therapy dogs do not have access rights protected by the American Disabilities Act. Um, in addition, there's emotional support animals. Emotional support animals do not require any specific training. Again, they're sort of function just to prevent comfort, and they do not have public access rights. So how can service dogs help veterans? Um, pictured on this slide is Frank um, and service dog Lydia. They were our first successful canine veteran pairing to come out of our organization. Um, Frank is a proud um, veteran of the United States Army. Uh, when we met Frank, he had not left his home in years. Um, he was really overwhelmed with anxiety and panic disorder um, and truly could not function out in the world um, unsupported. 
I'm proud to say that after pairing Frank and Lydia, um, Frank enrolled in community college. Um, he's been taking active courses. Um, he's pursuing a, a career um, in digital media. And we're really proud of um, you know, the partnership between Frank and Lydia. So service dogs can really function as a bridge between an individual um, and their environment to support a higher quality of life. So what sort of tasks do we train service dogs to do? Um, anything functional, from turning on lights, to opening doors, to carrying bags. Um, our dogs are also well-trained in providing medication reminders and fetching medication. Um, they're also uh, trained to provide alerts um, to individuals who perhaps have um, hearing loss um, or hearing loss related to a traumatic brain injury. And as I mentioned, a lot of our dogs are primarily trained as psychiatric service dogs. Um, and we train in a technique called deep, deep pressure therapy, excuse me. Um, DPT is sort of an escalating process. Um, so when a dog identifies um, sort of chemical changes in their partner, in their human partner, um, they provide an escalating um, sort of series of pressure. Um, you'll see here one of the first steps is to, to rest a head on the lap. Um, next may be to um, lift up and put a head and two paws on the lap. Um, and this process can get all the way to the point of the human laying completely flat on their back on the ground um, with the dog on top of them head to tail, head to toe. Um, I've actually seen this um, in real life. Um, we were going through a process of um, it's a bit of a matchmaking process, kind of like dating um, and pairing our dogs with their um, potential veterans. Um, and we were in the process of evaluating a partnership between one of our dogs and um, a veteran named Mike. And we happened to be at an event um, where there was a, a movie shown about the impact um, that the Iraq and Afghanistan war um, had left on some service members. It was quite emotional. Mike himself had served in those um, conflicts and became really overwhelmed watching the movie. Um, and the dog sensed that right away and sort of immediately applied this technique, um, helped Mike remove himself from the room, and then he was able to kind of come back and recenter. And it was a really emotional um, experience to kind of see that happen. Any questions about our training of our dogs? Okay, so just some service dog etiquette, some do's and don'ts. If you're out in public and you see um, a canine human um, pairing, it's really important um, that the dog is working. Um, best not to touch them or make eye contact or call their name. Um, if they are wearing their <laughs> there goes my dog in the background. Um, let's see. Um, it's best to ask the handler for permission to interact with the dog and be respectful if the handler says no. Um, that handler may be going through something at the moment and really need the full attention of the dog. <clears throat> also, don't speak to the dog or, excuse me one second. <clears throat> Lucy, um, don't speak to the dog or give commands. Um, that dog should know not to take commands from a stranger, only individual that they're working for. So do respect the direct commun communication between the handler and the dog. Um, don't come in between the handler and the dog. So if you're walking down a sidewalk or if you're in a supermarket, um, be sure to give the right of way to the team um, and ask the handler um, if there's a preference on which side you should sit or, or stand. Um, additionally, if, again, if you're walking down the sidewalk um, with your own pet, um, or if you know you're going to be in a setting with a service dog team, best not to allow your pet um, to interact with the service dog and their work. Um, and the last thing here on this slide, which is really important, is um, not to ask the handler specific questions about his or her disability and to respect their privacy. Um, so as part of the American Disabilities Act, there's no obligation um, for the handler to share any specific details about their condition. Um, they can be asked to, to demonstrate um, a task that the dog has been designed um, or trained, excuse me, to perform, um, but no questions. 
Um, so our organization right now um, is growing really rapidly. Um, we have a handful of successful canine veteran pairings that we're really proud of. We have a number of dogs um, in our training program right now, um, and we're expecting a few new puppies uh, this spring. One of our immediate goals is to um, locate a physical location that's compliant with um, ADA and is um, accessible um, to individuals with physical disabilities um, so that we can continue to grow um, our program. We're in the process of applying for certification through Assistance Dogs International. It's a very difficult and time consuming certification to obtain. Um, and we're hoping to um, identify a physical space around the time that we achieve that certification. Um, so what's next for us is I mentioned the accreditation and hopefully finding a physical space. Um, more dogs, more pairings. Um, so the Veteran Affairs, Department of Veteran Affairs is starting to come around um, to, I, to acknowledge that um, service dogs um, can provide an alternative therapeutic treatment to individuals with mental health affliction. Um, it's been shown already to reduce hospital stays and dependencies on prescription medication and we're really um, um, we feel strongly about advocating um, for service dogs in this space and to promote research um, and conversation around how service dogs can be beneficial to this population. Um, we're also always looking for partnerships with other community organizations that are aligned to support veteran causes. Um, one thing I've noticed is that there's a lot of um, great organizations in the in the Pennsylvania in the state of Pennsylvania, especially. But we all seem to be sort of in our own little lane. Um, definitely an opportunity for better collaboration there, and we we hope to pursue that further. So ways to give. Um, monetary donations are always helpful to organizations like ours. Again, we're one of the few organizations that actually donates the dogs um, to our veterans. We handle veterinary care, um, the cost of food, the cost of additional training and certification. Um, we also have am an Amazon wish list. <clears throat> If you're so inclined to perhaps buy a bag of treats or dog food, um, <clears throat> always looking for volunteers, especially skilled volunteers. Um, if you're savvy at updating a website or writing newsletters, um, your skills would be needed. And you can also help puppy raise. So um, the course of training for dogs in our program, again, is, is also pretty unique. Um, we have volunteer families that take in our dogs um, from eight weeks old and support us through the basic obedience training process which lasts for the first year or a year and a half of the dog's life. Um, they're responsible for taking that dog on field trips and um, training you know, specific tasks like carrying a bag of groceries from the supermarket. Um, and then from there, our dogs go into sort of a finishing training program with a behaviorist before they're ultimately paired with a veteran. Um, and all it takes almost, almost two years um, from puppy to pairing. Um, and so if you know of anyone who would be interested in puppy raising and, you know, making that commitment um, to a dog and to a veteran, send them our way. Like I said, we've got some cute puppies who will be coming this spring. Hard to ignore a cute puppy face. Um, but yeah, I think that was it from me. So I'll stop sharing. Are there any questions from the group? I noticed a few chats. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I have a question. Sure, Doris. Very often we relate to people through their dogs because that's a good entryway. Mm -hmm. And so how do we back off from that and, and relate in a different way? <laughs> that's a great question. Do you mean if you were to see sort of a service dog team in public? Yeah, anytime we see people with a dog yeah. and we don't know the person, very often we relate to that person first by praising the animal and so very forth. True. That's very true. Yeah, the way I look at it is, um, you know, the these are this is a team, right? This is a service dog team, um, and you know, respecting that bond is really important, um, and understanding that that individual probably couldn't be functioning in the environment in which you're encountering them if it weren't for that dog. So it's sort of a very symbiotic um, relationship. But 
I think you're right. You often see um, someone through the eyes of their dog uh, at times. But um, yeah, thank it's you for your question. Kind of usually, if the dog approves us, we're okay. Yep. And so what function does the service dog do in that respect? So does our encounter with the person with a service dog rely on the service dog to make us okay? I see what you're saying. Yeah, actually, so that the, in this setting, um, <clears throat> the dog's role is to make their person okay. Um, you know, not the stranger that's approaching them. Um, they have to be checking in and looking at their person um, and helping the person remove themselves from the situation if they're uncomfortable as well through perhaps a nudge or a tap. Um, all about keeping the person that they're working for comfortable. Yeah. Alicia? Alicia, yes. this is Bonnie. That was Hi, a Bonnie, beautiful nice presentation. Thank and you. it's wonderful what you're doing nice for you. veterans. And I wanted to ask you if there's a waiting list for veterans to be paired, and if so, how long it is? That's a great question. Um, at the time, I don't believe we have a waiting list. Um, there's quite a qualification process for the veterans in our program. Um, some more information on our um, website about that. Um, if you know of someone who may be interested, happy to connect offline um, and we can talk in more detail. Yeah, Alicia, Thank you. Uh, back Thank to the you. first question about uh, interacting with, uh, with the service dog. Sure. Aren't, aren't uh, all of the service dogs, uh, do, don't, don't they wear identification that they are a service dog so that it is really up to us, uh, a stranger on the street, to be aware of that and to, uh, um, before we do anything with the dog to interact with, with, the, with the other piece of the team. Absolutely. Yes, you're correct. Um, you know, some organizations provide a vest. Um, I think Susquehanna uses a bright yellow vest if you've ever seen those dogs out in public. Our dogs have sort of a military camo style vest um, with lots of different patches. Um, other programs use different color leashes. They might have a bright yellow tag on the leash that says that they're working. So that's a great tip. It's always helpful to kind of evaluate um, what that dog might be wearing to understand and if they are indeed um, a service dog and a working animal. Thank you. I just what wanted to share uh, the, the uh, get, um, okay. to respond to someone who approaches him or her or the dog inappropriately. Yeah, it's up to the handler um, to determine how to communicate. Um, you know, usually we just sort of respectfully try to um, share that the animal is working and use it as an opportunity for education. Um, I think now as emotional support and therapy dogs are becoming more prevalent and we're seeing them in public more often than perhaps, um, you know, we have in the past, um, you know, there might be some confusion on the part of the individual who's approaching. So, you know, we try to be, re you know, always encourage our handlers to be respectful and use it as an opportunity to educate. Uh, I'm going to suggest we move on with our service and then uh, maybe sure. after the service is over, um, Alicia can stay and we can uh, further ask her some questions if we want to do that. Thanks, Wayne. Thanks, everyone. I'll hang on.
let us remember in our prayer Charlene Siegel, Dick Link, David Pearson, Gabriela Orisis, George Harold, Karen Clark, and Kathy Reardon. Kimberly Chalmers, Linda Brown, Lorraine Emmerich, Lorraine Henson, Ray Steen, Rolf Brockovich, his family and friends, friend, family Kevin um, of Susan Omaya, and Suzanne Moeller. Today, dear Father, our creator and sustainer, we gather with hearts full of hope and courage at this pivotal moment in our nation's history. Many of us feel like we have won the battle for the soul of our country because of the political victory which came to a figurative close yesterday. We are buoyed up by the words of our new presidential team congratulating us for choosing the path of humility, decency, science, and truth. We were urged to continue our generosity of spirit and to love with abandon. As many people all over the country danced in the streets, dear God, we could grasp a vision of the world that works for everybody while being all too aware of those who felt left out of this celebration. Lord, we are aware of our need for healing in our fragmented society, deeply polarized in beliefs about how our nation should be governed. If ever there is a time that we need to draw close to you and find our way as a democratic nation where every person matters, it is now. Help us to stop labeling and judging and disparaging those who think differently from us. As your faithful people, we are calling upon your guidance and prayerfully ask for forgiveness and strength to listen, to learn to listen better to each other. Our Mother, Father, be with us now as we come to this moment aware of the peace that you bring us. Thank you for the ultimate solace and grounding that is your gift, always ours to claim, through faith in your abiding love for each of us. Dear God of us all, we are grateful today for the relative peace after the storm of our elections. Return us to our center of compassion and kindness for all as we continue to protest unfair treatment of so many of your children. We ask especially that you bless our elected leaders from both parties and guide them in finding common ground. Dear God of us all, as we recognize this 102nd anniversary of Armistice Day, we are aware of peace as the ending of bloodshed. We are grateful for the veterans who have served our country and especially for those who have lost their lives on the battlegrounds of the world. These are the saints that are now part of the great cloud of witnesses that we celebrated last week on All Saints Day. Those on whose shoulders we stand who are part of our legacy and foundation those who continue to guide and inspire us. Dear Father, we turn our attention now to our veterans who are returning from more recent world conflicts with physical and emotional scars. We thank you for the agency 
Alpha Beta Canine, who is providing needed services for veterans who are dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder and brain injury. Bless this agency's work in providing dogs trained to support the lives of those living with these life-altering disabilities. Dear Lord, help the scientists of the world to work together to discover a COVID vaccine. If ever we are brought to awareness of our dependence on each other as a global community, it is now. As we see COVID cases numbers rise, and again, no end in sight of more deaths to come. Comfort those who have lost their loved ones and been separated by the ravages of this pandemic. Please also support the political will of our world leaders grappling with climate change. Be with those people who have lost their homes and livelihoods and loved ones to natural disasters that have come to feel all so unnatural. Help us to make the personal sacrifices toward reducing our carbon footprint such as purchasing our electricity through companies that use renewable resources. Support the work of the Committee on Climate Change here at FUMCOG as they help to educate us on what we can each do to personally limit environmental destruction. Dear God, you know what we need to heal from our failure to value all life. Thank you for the Black Lives Matter movement giving us a fresh opportunity for self-examination and expressing our commitment to justice and fairness for all your people. Guide us as we discover new ways to lovingly care for each other as we extend our commitment to being fully inclusive. Bless the work of the Committee on Race as they guide us through this next phase of our development toward being an anti-racist congregation. Father, we echo the words of President-elect Joe Biden as he closed his speech last night, urging us to not just keep the faith, but to spread the faith, the faith that first was taught to us by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us say together now the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our mother, father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Freely we have received, freely we give with gratitude and joy. May we remember the church with our offerings, and if you would like to make a special offering to, to uh, Alpha Bravo Canine, just send it to the church and market um, Alpha, Alpha Bravo Canine. We, we thank, uh, we thank uh, Alicia for her witness and the gift that she brings to us and to our veterans. Let us pray our operatory prayer. Bless God, you have called us to contribute to the needs of the saints and to extend hospitality to strangers. Hallow these gifts that they may be a blessing to many in your name. Amen.
This is Wayne again. Before I do the benediction, I would just like to add my personal note to the offering. Um, I'd like to personally ask you to um, give a special offering to the Alpha Bravo K9. <clears throat> Whew. We are a church that doesn't hesitate to respond to the needs of our time and our money. And I truly believe that this is one of those needs to provide a veteran with a companion who will enable them to navigate their journey <clears throat> through this world in a safe, productive, and joyful way. So <clears throat> you can participate in a veteran's prayer by giving to the dogs. And now the benediction, benediction, which I, Oh my God, there we are, Woo. Uh, <clears throat> Benediction. As Carrie Newcomer reminds us, on the other side of midnight, just before the dawn, you can feel it coming up when the long night is done. It's as heavy as grief and it's weightless as smoke. It's the dream you forgot, it's the letter you wrote. It's the first birds of morning that sound like a hymn. Throw open the windows and let the light in. So go forth with the intent to be the light through someone's window, the answer to someone's prayers, the companion to one in need. And may the God's spirit surround you throughout your life's journey. Amen. Thank uh -huh.